Welcome everyone to the MongoDB podcast live. I'm seeing uh, Jesse Hall, a senior developer advocate here at MongoDB. And uh, we have a really cool topic to discuss today. We're going to talk about AI, vector embeddings, vector search, and HNSW. If you don't know what that is, stick around. Let us know in the chat, what is your experience with AI? We'd love to hear your thoughts and say hi as well. Let us know where you're joining from. Now, before we get going, uh, we would like to take a brief moment to acknowledge the ongoing conflict in Israel. The events have had devastating impacts on individuals and families, and we'd like to extend our thoughts to everyone affected by the situation. Uh, and we sincerely hope for a peaceful resolution to this longstanding conflict. And thank you for giving us a moment to address this serious issue. And so today we have a special guest. Without further ado, Let's bring on Henry Weller. Henry is the product manager for Atlas Vector Search. Welcome, Henry. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here, Jesse. Awesome. So to get us started, let's uh, maybe you could share a little bit about your background uh, with our audience. Uh, wh what got you into machine learning and AI stuff? Sure. Um, so I first kind of encountered machine learning and AI when I was in grad school uh, at Stanford in 2019. Um, so this was sort of the like the onset of a lot of these things that are now large language models. The transformer paper had had recently come out, and there were a lot of these um, like the BERT model was starting to become very widely accessible. I was in an NLP uh, with deep learning class, and I you know fine tuned BERT on a small Reddit data set. Kind of saw the the potential for it, but I was in grad school for robotics actually. So I worked at a robotics and machine learning startup called Osara for a few years after that. Um, and eventually made my way into sort of like the data engineering world, uh, which brought me to Mongo as a software engineer. And then recently expressed interest in, in you know, us putting forward a, a vector search product um, and got involved with that. So that's, that's sort of wind about way into this search world now. Nice. Okay. So robotics. And my first thought is, are you going to build a robot with AI? <laughs> How are we going to do that at Mongo, at MongoDB? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I think that our CTO, our former CTO, Elliot, is like working on uh, that kind of stuff now. He's working nice. on a robotic platform. So who knows, you know, databases, robotics, machine learning, those, yes. these are fundamental building blocks. I think there's probably some commonality between all these things uh, that, yeah. that drive people that are interested in like systems and to be, to be very compelled to work on them. Um, nice. That's very yeah. hand wavy, but uh, I, I like to think that there's a common thread between these things. I think so. I think they, they all go hand in hand for sure. Um, that's pretty cool stuff. So before we get like, into why we're here, I like to do this little icebreaker thing. It's, it's just a fun little, little game that um, I want the audience to participate as well. So we're, I'm gonna, it's going to be uh, really quick. I'm going to say, uh, ask a question. And the first thing that pops in your mind, say it. Audience, get ready on the keyboard. All right. Android or iPhone? iPhone. OK. Windows, Mac, or Linux? Hmm. Depends on what I'm doing, but probably Mac. Yeah. Mac. Okay. All right. I, I kind of, I go back and forth between Mac and Windows. Not much of a Linux person though. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right. The, your favorite code editor or IDE, and this could make or break our friendship here. Um, if I'm working on a big project, uh, PyCharm is pretty oh. nice. If I'm okay. like hacking together little scripts, I really like Sublime. Uh, okay, but pretty much anything with like basic syntax highlighting um, yeah, yeah. and code search is good for me. Okay, you know I'm the OG Sublime text editor guy too. Uh, right now I love VS Code, obviously, but um, that that's 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 great. So when you're actually coding, tabs or spaces? Uh, tabs. Tabs. Okay. I'll, I, generally, I'll just go with whatever prettier you know throws out there. But yeah, pretty much tabs is so much easier. Um, okay, last one: Co coffee or tea? I wish I, I wish I could be a tea person. I feel like they've got like this like Nirvana vision of the world that I'm a, I'm a coffee person. Yeah. One a day now it used to be two a day. So I'm at least I'm growing in that respect. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have to have my, my one in the morning and then sometimes I'll skip the afternoon to just depends. Awesome. All right. Let's, let's enough of that. I see a bunch of comments from the audience. Thank you all for playing along as well. Uh, it looks like we've got a bunch of Android windows. Uh, VS Code, uh, Nokia. Somebody's using a Nokia and a Mac. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> okay. All right. Let's get into uh, what we're here to talk about today. I'm going to go ahead and let me know when you're ready to share your screen and I'll bring your screen up, Henry. Go for it. Okay. So here is your slides and go ahead and take it away and we'll ask questions. Audience, if you have uh, any questions as we go, ask them in the chat. We'll, we'll answer them if they're applicable to what we're talking about. Uh, we also have moderators uh, who are going to be uh, helping to answer questions as well. And oh yeah, one last thing. This is <coughs> So uh, if you're not able to stick around for the entire thing, come back later, uh, video on, de on demand, you'll be able to watch it. All right, take it away, Henry. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I guess before going into any of the, the content for the slides, just to set the stage a little bit. Um, so in my work as the PM for Vector Search, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to customers and sort of walking through what the product is, uh, what it can do, and sort of this big distinction between like exact nearest neighbor search and approximate nearest neighbor search. Um, and I, I have like a few like sides that I show in my tech demo, but there's always this thing of like, how does this index that you guys use uh, called hierarchical navigable small worlds or HNSW, it'll be written out in a future slide. So you don't mm -hmm. need to like memorize that for now. How does this actually work? Like what are the, the mechanics behind it? What it's like a good like intuition uh, for how to think about it. Um, and I never have enough time in these calls to really get through it. So I'm really hoping to like, when I was thinking of a topic for what I would want to share with as many people, uh, this was like the first thing that came to mind. Nice. Um, but yeah, um, basically, uh, just to give a quick review for those that uh, couldn't attend for Cool's talk where he, he quickly went through this as well. Um, Atlas Vector Search is a uh, capability within MongoDB Atlas, our managed data platform. Um, so going to do a little review over some of the functionality before I get into the actual uh, indexing uh, nuts and bolts. Um, at a basic level, uh, we believe that you can do vector search uh, directly on the documents that exist within a MongoDB collection. Um, this is an example of a, of a document where you might have a call transcript from an earnings call uh, with a set of metadata, um, but really the the more important thing is this content field, which is, you know, it could be a, a really long, uh, you know, uh, chunk of text, you know, depending on the max sequence length of the embedding model you can use, you can have thousands of tokens, which get passed to an embedding model and get produce some fixed length vector um, of floating point numbers, which we can then define a vector index for, um, define a similarity method to use. So when you're comparing a query vector to a bunch of your index vectors, like what geometric um, compar comparison do you want to use? Is it Euclidean distance? Is it dot product? Is it cosine? Typically, the embedding model you use defines like which one of these you might want, um, as well as what metadata do you want to filter on? Um, that's another thing we offer. And then recently, we, we updated this. So folks that are familiar with Atlas Vector Search might have use this dollar search syntax. We recently announced the dollar vector search syntax and we put out a lot of documentation very recently about um, the distinctions between this and, and, and uh, dollar search, but it's essentially using an MQL uh, filter and adds additional parameters that make things that are relevant to HNSW, which I'll explain easier to configure. Yeah, and like, like uh, Henry mentioned uh, last week, we did a stream with uh, Prakul and uh, he went into more detail. So uh, after this, if you want to watch that one, if you haven't watched it yet, go back. It's on the YouTube channel, uh, and you can get a deeper dive into uh, how all of this works. Awesome. Yeah, but I think, uh, yeah, and then this is a new uh, sort of like example of what this query syntax might look like. So typically you would, you know, take a plain English query, embed it uh, into the same embedding space that your index data was embedded with, um, and then request a certain number of vectors. You can also add this like num candidates parameter. It's not shown in this example, mm -hmm. um, which acts as like a, you know, you're over requesting. So you're building a, a certain number of possible candidates that would be considered as the closest vector. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find that with HNSW, um, you know, you might not be guaranteed to get the closest vector based on how your graph is constructed. Um, and so if you request more, you're more likely to get the nearer vector and then you can limit down to the final results that you're actually interested in. Nice, nice. Um, so you, you get the the big pool, and it's not a hundred percent maybe what you're looking for. And then you kind of narrow that down. You know that what what it returns is going to be you know, relevant to what you're searching for. 
Exactly. And there's ways of measuring that accuracy, that relevancy. Um, you know, if you have an exact search set um, and you, you know, would expect your approximate nearest neighbor search to return something similar, you can compare the overlap from the two result sets as mm -hmm. a way of gauging what's called recall. Um, and so typically the trade off with these approximate algorithms is trading off recall mm -hmm. with latency. Right? Gotcha. Based on, but again, we'll get into all that in just a sec. <laughs> cool. Um, what is the highest latency thing you can do when you're doing vector search? Well, that would be looking at every single vector in your system, basically. So if you have a vector, a query vector, and you want to uh, assess all the different embedded documents that you have, you would, in the most naive case, look at every single vector uh, mm -hmm. in your space. There's other methods that exist out there that are not necessarily index-based, where you can like maybe cluster these vectors into centroids and then return a centroid. You can partition your vector space in various ways. Um, but the main thing I want to talk about today is like a sort of a graph based way of doing this um, mm -hmm. called HNSW. But even before we get to that, I want to sort of help build intuition for what it means to build a, a graph based uh, structure. So this is this is me and Jesse uh, okay. <laughs> located in a, a, a grassy field somewhere. That's the kind of drawing that I do too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you got to start very simple, I think, yes. with some of these things. Um, so I guess the, the challenge here is I want to get to Jesse uh, as quickly as possible and without having to walk too far. So I might live in a city, uh, you know, the same city as Jesse, hypothetically, and there might be a bunch of bus stops that I can use. So the, these bus stops might have been designed in a way such that, you know, the most, uh, like the shortest, path between the furthest nodes is minimized, but mm -hmm. also that it is able to reach the most places. There's this sort of balance of, you know, you don't want, uh, I don't want to hop on a bus and, and wait 10 stops to get to Jesse. Like mm -hmm. I would like it to be like two to three stops, but I would also like the place that I get dropped off to be pretty close to Jesse. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't want to walk that far. I'm very lazy. <laughs> um, and so that might look like this, this might be like the shortest path. Uh, maybe the one on the right is even closer to Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> maybe this is an optical illusion. Who knows? Uh -huh. um, but like this basic idea of designing uh, bus stops and figuring out like you know where to put them, and as the distribution uh, changes, maybe Addison joins, and there's another person that needs to be considered when designing your bus stops. Uh -huh. um, you start to see, uh, you know, that this problem becomes a little bit more complex. However, I think one thing that's worth noting is that we don't live in the same city. You know, it's, it's very possible. You know, I, I asked Jesse before this call, where, where do you live? Uh, yeah. And he said he lives near Houston and I live in New York. Mm -hmm. So taking the bus, you know, especially a bus that is connected to people that live regionally might take an extremely long time. You know, yeah. sure there's Greyhound buses, but even that might not be the most expedient way of getting around. So. There's this, you can imagine that there's a bus network in each of our cities. Um, and then that represents sort of one level of the hierarchy of transportation. Right? These nodes are connected in such a way that in the locality that we're in, it's easy enough to get around, mm -hmm. right? The people are clustered in the cities. And so you could design a, a set of bus, a bus system that's local to each of those cities. Mm -hmm. And as the population changes that you can move these bus stops around or add additional uh, routes. But how would I get between these cities? I guess my question right. to you, Jesse. Yeah. How would I you mean, suggest uh, I do that? <laughs> um, well, I don't know that there's a, I mean, I mean, like you said, Greyhounds might be the, but these <laughs> specific like in inner city buses, I don't, they don't go between cities. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever taken an airplane? Because oh. they're, pr they're pretty <laughs> useful. <laughs> That would be um, the way to go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in this case, uh, you know, there's there's probably an airport that's located near to one of these bus stations. Yes. And I can uh, essentially take that air an airplane, get off the airplane, be at a bus station, and then take that to the nearest bus station yes. that's closest to Jesse. Mm. There's two things that are slightly unintuitive <laughs> about this analogy. Uh, one is that this assumes that it's like instantaneously as quick to go from one bus stop to another as it is to go from one airport 
to another. Mm -hmm. We all know there's like airport security and there isn't like bus security and that might mm -hmm. not be exactly true, but for the sake of the analogy, let's imagine that we move at the exact same speed between nodes, uh, in this case, between airports or between bus stops. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The other thing is you'll notice that there's like no arrow between me and any of the bus stops in the airport. We kind of just imagine at the starting point, like I'm at the airport already. So mm -hmm. we start at the highest level uh, of like most sparsely connected um, graph that traverses like this geography, which might be the whole United States. And then when we get to the, um, the closest point at that highest, most sparsely connected level, then we move down to the level of the bus. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that we could even take this further and say, maybe there's walking routes near the bus stop. And I would move from one route to another. And that, and that route is represented as a set of walking nodes. Mm -hmm. I could have represented that further as like a third level of hierarchy. And so basically, this is like kind of what is happening um, when we think of HNSW. I'll talk more about the specifics, but I like to have this, this like image in my head of various modes of transit that mm -hmm. represent some kind of intelligently connected graph that was thoughtfully designed by some city designer, some transit mm -hmm. planner um, that balances sort of this connectivity so being able to um, get from one place to another that's as close to my final destination as I want, regardless of kind of where I started from, mm -hmm. and complexity. Like, I don't want to have to jump through like yeah. 50 nodes to get to you. I want to be able to jump through like the fewest possible nodes that get me as close as I possibly can to you. And mm -hmm. having various levels of transportation to do that, you know, could be you're on a different planet, you're in Houston. Uh, Texas Mars, you know, <laughs> like a rocket might be necessary before I even get right. on an airplane. Um, that's kind of the balance yes. that you're trying to strike here. And that's what these like varying levels of hierarchy uh, of graphs uh, kind of provides. Nice. That makes sense. Any any questions so far, audience? I don't I haven't seen any. Um, actually, well, so there's this one here. This person knows exactly what HNSW is. Oh, nice. <laughs> do you, do you, I've been like hinting at it. I haven't shown anything that even describes it fully yet. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you if you see the screen, but it's uh, from uh, Charles Burnett. He says, we all know it stands for Henry Navigable uh, Small Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, little known fact. Um, uh, I awesome. guess he's seen, he's seen these slides. Um, nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, um, before we, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 for sure. I think uh, it looks like the audience is up to speed as well. Um, yeah, so we can move cool. forward with your presentation yeah sweet um so i think this idea of, of like hierarchy and using it to sort of effectively traverse um these types of graphs is, is a really interesting one and actually from the paper that hmsw was introduced in 2016 they reference explicitly mm -hmm. this uh, this idea of skip lists mm -hmm. so instead of uh, having hierarchical graphs skip lists are basically hierarchical linked lists um, you're still doing a comparison at each node, but um, what you're trying to do is get to the closest number um, on the bottom layer, um, given an entry point into a top layer, which is much more sparsely connected. Hmm. So the bottom layer, layer zero, is just a full linked list. You know, it's ordered uh, from the smallest number to the largest number. And so let's say I have a, a query number, um, 20, and so what I would do is I would start at the top layer, which in this case is one entry point at seven. I would say, oh, seven is less than 20. So, and there's nothing else. So I have to go to the next connected level for this number, which is at layer two. Mm -hmm. um, I would then, so this is going from my airplane to my bus. Uh, and then I would say, is there any number at this level that is, um, that is less that I can move to that is less than 20? There is. So I go to 15. So I move from this one node to the next node. And then I assess, is there any number that is uh, less than 20? There isn't because the next one is 28. So I go down another layer again. Is there any number that is uh, less than 20? There is not, it's 21. I go down again. Is there any number that's less than or equal to 20? There is. So then I found my, my final answer. And in doing this, I traversed fewer nodes than I would have if I just started at four and went right to 20. Right. I looked at this guy, I, I moved down, I looked at this guy, I moved down, and now I'm here. It's true that I also compared against my neighboring nodes at 28 um, and 21. Um, but still, you could imagine if 
I had even more nodes and maybe even the, the connectedness of each of these linked lists was, was different. Mm -hmm. The number of nodes that I would have to visit would still be less than the linear scan I would do of my linked list. Nice. That makes it much quicker. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's also a nice intuition builder. Cause it's like, oh, this is, this is actually quite similar to what I do when I do vector comparisons, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm looking at uh, a single node in front of me instead of like all the neighbors that a given node might have, mm -hmm. but I'm still doing a, a geometric comparison. You know, in this case, is it less than the, the target value? In another case, it might be, you know, what is the smallest um, Euclidean distance between the target value and each of my neighbors? Mm -hmm. um, Euclidean distance just being the squares of the sums of the dimensions or, uh, you know, the distance between each of the dimensions squared. Mm -hmm. uh, Summed across all the dimensions. I'll pretend like I know exactly what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, essentially like the Pythagorean theorem mm -hmm. without having to square root things. Nice, cool. Uh, and so you take this idea, and then it's basically just dropped in on this other idea, which is called navigable small worlds, um, where basically this looks like a, a crazy side, but mm -hmm. the basic idea here is. Navigable small worlds are trying to trade off clustering where you have like nodes that are connected to each other with diameter, which is the uh, shortest path between the furthest nodes, right? You want mm -hmm. to have a low diameter and you want to have high clustering. You want to have nodes that are near each other to be reasonably clustered such that uh, traversing the graph is like more intuitive. Like I don't mm -hmm. always just, when I, when I find my spot in the graph, when I get into an area, the neighboring nodes like have something in common, mm. but um, they're, they need to be built in such a way that there's connectivity between nodes. So at a random network where you have absolutely no idea what's, you know, you just completely randomly initialize the edges between all your nodes. Mm -hmm. There's not really the sense of like each node, like having anything to do with any of its neighbors. However, mm -hmm. you can get between nodes like very quickly, like very far nodes like are connected. You have like these yeah. bridges between them. And so, this idea of the small world network was to try to like rewire like this regular network and, and make it look a little bit more like a random network. So build these like bridges between um, far nodes um, mm -hmm. while still maintaining, you know, high clustering as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, the actual mechanism by which um, this is maintained is sort of during construction. So in this, in this example, I start, this, I have a set of vert uh, vertices that I'm adding one at a time. So the first one is A, the second one is B. There's all these other nodes that I add, but you'll notice that A and B, relative to a lot of the other nodes, are not the closest vectors to each other, right? Like A is much closer to D and to C and even to H mm -hmm. than it is to B. Yeah. But because I had that as my initial, uh, my edge, and I specify, you know, I could only have so many edges uh, for A, um, H doesn't get connected to A when it gets added, it gets connected to C and D. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be high clustering between A and H, but there isn't this like system where you have like a lattice where every neighboring vector is connected to each other, regardless of whether or not its neighbor is already connected to mm -hmm. um, the node that I'm interested in. You're trying to balance like this idea of like connectedness where I can get to H easily from A with like redundant connections. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically I think it's kind of important when you're doing search, um, in this process, you're, you're basically picking a point, um, at random and you're saying, okay, is there a point closer to my query vector? Yes. If so, move towards it. And you basically, there's different types of like search algorithms that you can perform, but mm -hmm. uh, a basic, like, you know, greedy search would take you from A to D, D to E. E to H and then H to L. And if there's no closer vector to the query, then I will just return L. Mm -hmm. um, That's the, the basic idea. Um, so this would be everything in the US is connected by a bus. And mm -hmm. my bus stations are optimally designed, but I still need to take a bus to, at each node. And so that's still many, many nodes uh, between yeah. me and my final destination, you can imagine between New York and Texas. Right, right. So how many hops will it take to get there? <laughs> In this case, yeah, in this case, yeah. it's, what is it? One, two, three, four hops, mm -hmm. but between, you know, New York and Texas, I would imagine there's quite a few <laughs> stations. 
Yes. Well, I wouldn't know. So, <laughs> I would so, imagine. <laughs> so that's that's like honestly like the big idea, uh, right? So here you have uh, your your layer two. The big idea of of HNSW is to split these things hierarchically with mm -hmm. uh, you know layer zero resembling that navigable small words graph where every single node is connected um, with certain parameters that I'll explain in a second. Um, and then decreasing levels of connection as you go up. So each node has some probability of appearing on an upper layer. Mm. Um, and that probability increases the further down you go and it's guaranteed to appear on the bottom layer. Okay. Um, but this way you always start your search instead of, instead of starting it here and then traversing this densely connected graph, you start at the top mm. and you say, okay, uh, this is my entry point. Is there a closer node to my query? There is. So I'll move in that mm -hmm. direction. Is there a closer node to my query? There is not, but there is a connected layer that I can move down to. So I continue this process until I get to the bottom layer, the most densely connected graph, where hopefully I'm closer to yeah. my final destination and I don't have to do all, all these hops within this most densely connected graph. This is like 3D chess. <laughs> <laughs> but for sure uh, i mean it, it i can see how it's it's much faster because you're skipping like in, instead of doing it linear, linearly uh you're skipping some nodes in order to get there yeah exactly nice uh, i i think even if you do the navigable small words graph it still performs better than linear um because you you know based on your search method you still wouldn't need to like explore like, this edge over this node over here you'd still right. like eventually find your way. It's just the, the complexity of getting there is still a little bit too high. So this is mm -hmm. almost, this is an improvement on an improvement, which was yes. already out there. Nice. Um, so how do we build these things? That's you what know, I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> how does this yeah. actually get built? How do you, is this during, well, you probably go about the answer this, but is this during <laughs> the, uh, the embedding process during the, the modeling process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about like general parameters that get considered, and then we'll talk about, okay, I'm going to add a single node. What does that look like? Yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, the, the most important point that to understand is like, how does this layering even work? Like, like, what is this? How would I go about populating various levels? Like, mm -hmm. how do I, how many layers do I actually have in my graph? Um, and I think it's like, it's very important to know that there's this, um, this mechanism by which each node is assigned uh, essentially a layer number. You know, that layer tells me, okay, this is the highest layer that this node will appear at. Um, and it's essentially like the negative log of a uniform distribution between zero and one times some uh, level multiplier, uh, which is a, what our first construction parameter. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to set this to zero, then you would be getting uh, essentially every <laughs> L equals negative natural log of a random number between zero and one uh, times mm. zero, which is mm. always zero. So no mm. matter what I do, everything is on zero. I've just produced a navigable small worlds graph. Congrats, mm. but that might not be what I want. Okay. Um, I actually, I do want to have a few things exist on, at a varying levels of sparseness above me so that I can exploit that sort of like behavior where I, I move between nodes that are far from each other on this graph, and then mm. I can locally explore uh, travel my best stations. Um, so this this uh, this plot shows um, this is uh, from this uh, really great uh, tutorial on HNSW from towards data science, mm -hmm. where as I increase this this ML value to from 0.25 to 1.5, um, what is the the distribution of my Ls? So how many nodes uh, fall on four levels? How many nodes fall on three levels? Uh, how many nodes fall on two? How many nodes fall on one? Um, uh, and X is the uh, percentage uh, mm -hmm. of nodes, so from zero to one. Uh, so you can see it's like the, a larger and larger fraction exist on levels one and zero, uh, smaller exist on two and zero, two, one and zero, and then three, one and zero, and then four. And I, and I think all of these examples that even have four is just like a single entry point. So mm -hmm. the most sparsely connected graph, it's like looking at planet Earth and there's no interstellar travel. So I'm just going to say, okay, I'm on planet Earth. Let's go take a look at the airports on planet Earth. Got it. Um, that makes uh, sense. Yeah. As you, so there's like this thing where, okay, I have more overlap between my layers as I'm increasing, um, as I'm increasing ML. 
um, which is good because it means that I can sort of take, I can leverage this hierarchy. But the the paper says uh, it, it doesn't have, it has like some experimental like results, but they say like, basically you would want to like, not have this be too large. Like you wouldn't want there to be too much overlap mm. um, between uh, your layers, but you definitely don't want too little because then you don't have enough layers. So in practice from what I've seen with a lot of libraries is this is like one over the natural log of M, which is a different construction parameter that I'll talk about in a little bit. So um, actually I'll talk about it right now. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, let's just, let's take this example where I have a node, uh, that has an L of two. So I have, you know, some uniform, some random number pulled from a uniform distribution multiplied by ML, uh, times the, na the negative natural log of that times ML, um, gives me some floating point number that is closest to two. That tells me that I need to go about inserting this node. And so what I would do is I would ignore layer four, ignore layer three. And then starting at layer two, drop this node down um, and connect it to the nearest neighbors that exist already on that node. M is our next construction parameter, which tells me how many edges I'm going to build when I add a new node. Mm -hmm. um, there's a separate parameter called EF construction, which says how many edges will, how many nodes of what could be the neighboring nodes will I explore before I build these edges? Uh -huh. So that's sort of like its own search process mm -hmm. where I'm saying, okay, I want to make sure that I'm pretty confident that the edge I'm connecting to is the closest possible edge. There's another mm -hmm. heuristic I'll talk about where maybe I'll ignore an edge if it's uh, already got an edge uh, uh, that is even smaller, uh, built with, next to it. I'll talk about mm -hmm. that in a second, but the basic idea is you would want to make sure that uh, I get connected um, to the right nodes when I'm inserting mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there's another two parameters, <laughs> which is that we can't have overly connected nodes. We can't have nodes with too high of a degree. Um, so there might be a node, like in this case, um, this node over here, it says each node can have no more than M max equals three edges. Mm -hmm. So I might be trying to build this node here, but it already has three edges. So I would probably ignore it and connect to say this other node over here. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of like restricting um, sort of the complexity of this, mm -hmm. of any individual graph where you would have one vertex that is far too high of a degree um, mm -hmm. such that like so many nodes would travel to it um, rather than traveling to an adjacent node that's further. And then there's at the bottom layer, this mostly dense, this most densely connected graph, which has every single node, there's a separate M max, um, which is typically set to two times M from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, so, so construction parameters I tried to highlight, but you have your level multiplier, your M. So that's the number of edges you create when you add a node your EF construction, so the number of nodes you explore before you add edges, your M max, uh, which is the max number of edges a node can have, and then your M max zero, which is the max number of edges the bottom layer nodes can have. This makes, I mean, I'm trying to think of a, what happens when uh, a node gets dropped and it's closer to another node, but it already has the max edges. Is there like a, a process that can redefine that or it just automatically finds the nearest ones that that don't have the max edges already mm, that's a really good question like it's um, like as your as your data is evolving so i'm curious i mean maybe this is um too deep in the weeds but and let me know if, if if it's going off off base here but um as your data evolves and your nodes change can those connections change or should they so i always think back to like this initial navigable small worlds construction graph, mm -hmm. where it's like the fact that I've added more nodes means that A and B, which are uh, still connected, but not as close as they possibly could. Yeah. Like that's both like a good thing and a bad thing. Like okay. I might actually be most interested in H from mm -hmm. B and I need to have a hop to, from C to H. Mm -hmm. um, um, but basically in this case, like uh, this is sort of like 
uh, the connectedness is balanced against the complexity based on the fact that the node distribution like changes over time. Yeah. Like the graph that I have at this point represented, you know, the closest points between nodes. Mm -hmm. And then that, that held true for a time and then became yeah. less true as more and more nodes are added. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your, to the immediate question, I'm pretty sure, but I would need to double check to confirm yeah. that those edges just get snipped out. Uh, gotcha. I don't think that there's this like reconnection process where they get reassigned to another node. They just get snipped away. Mm -hmm. And then basically, if you were to then add another Samora node, an edge could be built mm -hmm. uh, from C to that new node, what's after I, J. Mm -hmm. uh, so imagine I deleted H. Yeah. Uh, I guess D is a better example because it looks like it has high, vert uh, high degree. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to snip out H and I add a J, then it could be immediately connected to D and mm -hmm. A. Um, but I do want to talk about the, this important heuristic first. Um, oh yeah, this is a, just a quick, uh, plot from the original paper sort of showing, uh, different results, uh, as they vary and max zero. So this is the, the bottom level, uh, construction parameter, um, defining how many edges a single node can, can have. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they say that they've auto selected two M for m max times zero, and they found that at this at this value that they got the best balance against query time and recall. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have this other plot where they show like, okay, if we change the value of m, so the the value you know at m max zero is still two times m. Um, you can see like the impact on recall. In this case, you would want smaller, lower recall and further to the left query time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so 10 times 10 to the zero is pretty bad. 10 to the negative one, uh, 10 negative two, like these are all getting much better, um, but your query time does take a hit. Nice. There is a question here. Let me bring it up from uh, Carlos. It says, what criteria is used to assign a node to a layer, some kind of hashing? I uh, we covered that a couple of slides back. Yeah, yeah. so that would be the this, this mm -hmm. component. So every node is assigned a variable uh, which is an integer L, which is essentially the natural log of a random number uh, pulled from a uniform distribution between zero and one times some multiplication uh, level multiplier factor. Mm -hmm. So this is going to produce a float, but then it gets converted to an int, and then that'll tell you, okay, L equals two. So mm -hmm. in that case, it's this node is going to exist on levels which, two, yeah. one, and zero. Nice. Nice. Okay. If, hopefully that answers your question. Let us know if, if not. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. So, looks looks like everyone's keeping up so far. I don't see too nice. many questions. <laughs> we can keep going. Nice. So one um, sort of heuristic that's called out in the paper, which I think is quite important for sort of like this balance between correlation and connectivity that we talked about is um, they, they call it... Um, Oh, there's a specific name for this heuristic that I'm, it's mm. escaping me, but yeah. you could imagine a situation where you have like this, this type of graph where you have three clusters, uh, mm. you know, node A over here in cluster one, there's a cluster two with a bunch of anonymous nodes and then B, C, D, E in this third cluster. Now I'm trying to add X to, to this graph. Mm. The, the thing you might think is like, oh, obviously I would just connect it to B and C because that's where it is. That would guarantee high clustering coefficients. But then I would kind of have the situation where I'd have three clusters that are not loosely connected mm -hmm. at all. Um, and so what is done here is instead of making those connections, they make this assessment which says, okay, mm -hmm. um, the connection that I would have made, I make a connection between X and B, but then I notice that the, the distance between B and C, uh, which is already, B is already connected to X, is, mm -hmm. is smaller than the distance between X and C. So I already kind of have this connection, right? At two at level at two levels deep, I'm connected to it mm -hmm. um, by an edge that's smaller than this new edge that I would be creating. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing that, look at the next nearest node, which in this case is A. So th this way you kind of create these long jumps even within a single graph. You know, the, the big log jump is like skipping things entirely by mm -hmm. a, a different graph that's above, a few layers above you. Yeah. But this is another way of kind of like uh, enabling that connectivity without just having everything be closely clustered. That makes sense. Because then that even shortens the, the distance for D and E to A as well. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or it especially uh, shortens it for B. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it, from exactly. B to A is yeah, uh, yeah. is now two jumps. Previously it was like one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven jumps. Nice. Um so this is like a really nice uh property that they added in. Nice. Um yeah, just a quick review over some of the construction knobs. You know, the the layer, the level multiplier is the way to sort of define how many uh, the distribution of nodes across the different layers. Um, EF construction tells you how many neighboring nodes to search when you add uh, a node, and then M tells you how many edges to build off that node, and then M max, M max zero tell you, given uh, you know layers one and up, and then layer zero, how many. Um, what is the max degree of any single node? And so don't overly connect any any node um, is the main idea. So mm -hmm. one thing I, that's worth pointing out is like, okay, that's great, Henry. You know, you've shown me all these things. How does this actually affect, you know, my index? Like yeah. how would I how would I use this information to build a, a graph that trades off, um, you know, giving me the most accurate uh, vector uh, from a query vector with latency, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in this this concept of skipping a bunch of unnecessary nodes, but mm -hmm. I also like, you know, I, I might not want to skip the nodes that actually take me where I need to go. Right. Um, you know, there's, you know, I, I could have too many bus stops, but the bus stops might actually get me exactly where I want to go and I only have to walk one block. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the whole thing. Um, you know, EF construction and M are, are like, the two like main ways that I would suggest like uh, tuning this, you know, typically ML, as I mentioned, is actually a factor of M. Uh, it depends uh, what the, what the vertex uh, degree is on how many, on what the overlap between layers should be. Mm -hmm. There's sort of like this, this relationship there. And then basically EF construction is, is also somewhat related to M. You know, if I, if I want to have, let's say five connected edges, I might want to search like, you know, five times 10 as many uh, neighboring nodes to accurately assign those edges. Mm. Um, and then M max and M max zero are also factors of M. Uh, so again, you kind of have this idea mm. of like, okay, this connectivity of this graph M is really uh, like a lot of the other things come out of it. You can, you can, you know, say, uh, you know, I want to tune these parameters myself. Like, sure, the paper yeah. says experimentally these things work, but um, you can almost like tune these things. Um, but yeah, at a basic level, like, you want to have, if you want to have very few jumps, like it depends on your use case. Maybe mm -hmm. you're, you're cool with like a recall level of like 80%. Um, mm -hmm. You can, you can really like exploit uh, tuning these construction parameters to have as many skips as you want um, and have very low degree vertices to get you a good enough answer. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a, a really large number of vectors and you're traversing, like they're, they're clustered in, in such a way that making all these skips is, is like reasonable enough. Like this might be a, a good approach. Um, yeah. But if you need like a very precise answer um, that still leverages like the hierarchy, uh, the hierarchical nature of like having these layers, mm -hmm. um, you still, it's still faster than exact search. You might want to like tighten up some of these parameters, make yeah. these, these vertices higher degree um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So there's trade-offs uh, just depends on your use case. You want it to be fast and somewhat accurate or a little bit slower and very accurate, I guess. Mm -hmm. Basics, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, there is one other question. Let's see. Um, the normalization that you mentioned a couple of slides before refer to flatten the graph a bit. Yes. Yes. So, um, so basically, in this case. Um, I think normalize is kind of a funny term here. Yeah. I probably should should strike that. But basically, you're trying to define, uh, given this level multiplier, like essentially the degree to which um, a node is more or less likely to appear on multiple levels. So mm -hmm. if you make it really hard for a node to have an integer that's produced from this function of greater than zero, mm -hmm. it's highly unlikely you're going to see uh, nodes on superseding layers from layer zero. You're going to have mostly everything be on layer zero, which means you're not going to be able to skip around zones on layer zero via layer one. And similarly, if you don't even have a layer two, you can't skip around layer one. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to make it easier for nodes to have a higher L, then it makes it more likely that you have more nodes on 
up, up, uh, higher layers, which allows you to skip around more easily. Mm -hmm. And I guess that skipping around comes into the the tuning of it because you could possibly mm -hmm. skip around too much and not be as yeah. as efficient, right? Yeah. So so this requires a bit of a uh, uh, tuning to to make sure it, it gives you the outcome that you're looking for for your use case. Yeah. All right. I think that answered Carlos's question. Awesome. Cool. What what do you have what do you have next? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, just very basically, uh I think it's worth calling out like some of the the properties here. So, you know, appends take a logarithmic time. Um if you have n nodes, it's going to be n log n. Um but that's uh that could be considered to be a bit expensive, but it's it's not like o of 1, like adding to the end of a list. Mm -hmm. Um and they, but this is usually the case with with like graphs and, and tree based data structures, right? Like you need to adjust the overall structure somewhat, like add new edges to nodes that already exist, traverse uh, the graph intelligently. Um, but this, again, as I'll talk about in query time, like gives you much, much lower latency queries than you would previously. So I would take an O of log n, append an O of log n query, which is basically what it ends up being over an O of one append and an O of n query any day um, for these use cases. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. It's important to remember the, the heuristic that I called out that allows pockets of locally uh, clusters of nodes to be connected to one another. Um, and then also that you have, you know, various knobs that you can use to tune latency recall at the construction level. Mm -hmm. um, at, the, uh, at the search level, um, it is kind of what I was describing before. It's actually, I think it's kind of nice that the process by which you search is very similar to the process by which you add a node, mm -hmm. right? At, at layer two, uh, and oh, I almost, I can't believe I almost forgot to mention this. This process that I did at layer two, where I inserted this node, is repeated at layer one and layer uh, zero, okay. right? Like you're, I'm gonna be doing my EF construction, I'm gonna use that and the and add the number of M nodes at each of these levels, mm. right? So I'm creating these, these different yeah. graphs. When I'm searching, um, I always start at the top level and I say, okay, I, I have another parameter called EF search, which is very similar to EF construction. It's also mm -hmm. called num candidates in our API for dollar okay. vector search, which tells me, okay, look around uh, and have various entry points um, that I use to then uh, essentially explore as, as close to this query vector as I can. So mm -hmm. in the example I gave above, uh, the initial example, you know, I start at the top level, I move here, then I move here and I drop and I keep moving until I'm at the bottom level at the nearest the nearest level. So this is the query, the nearest neighbor in layer to star. Um, that's great. There might actually be another entry point that I could have taken, which would have brought me somewhere else in the graph, maybe on the mm -hmm. other side of star at some node that's not shown here. Mm -hmm. That would be good to consider. So EF's uh, search, uh, similar to EF construction, is like the number of places within my um, graph that I will then explore um, to yield the at the bottom level the closest possible vector, which then I would build up. So I, mm -hmm. I it's like my shots on goal uh, with EF search, and then I build up, uh, reduce the list of that, which is the limit parameter in our API, which mm -hmm. says, okay, I've looked at you know thirty nearest nodes get from thirty different entry points. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Now I'm just going to take the top five, so the ones that have the the, the smallest distance from each of these. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically it. Those are the only two real search parameters you need to be aware of. You know, construction is real is really where the nuts and bolts come in. Uh, mm -hmm. Search is just how many vectors you're interested in and how many candidates do you want to consider. So, what is like the size of your priority queue, right. um, essentially? Yeah. Again, that comes in. So there's tuning on the back end and there's tuning on the front end too. How fast do you want? Yep. Because if your num candidates is a thousand. And then it's going to take a while to to find all of those, and then but you're going to get a very exact re result when if you're if you're taking going from a thousand down to ten, um, but it's going to take longer. So if you you know shorten that pool uh, and, and and tune those those parameters, um, you can go. I, it look, looks like the graph on the right is the the, the query time uh, versus yeah. the recall, right? So it kind yeah, of goes so into that graph there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So th this is sort of the comparison across different algorithms. Um, so, um, but yeah, um, 
the, the, the main idea there is, is like searching, uh, you know, also takes logarithmic time. You don't need to explore every possible vector in your space. Um, and this gives you, and get, given the hierarchy that you are able to have, like this gives you a dramatic query time improvement over a brute force solution, mm -hmm. um, or even a navigable small world solution. Yeah. Um, nice. So yeah. Um, any any more slides after this? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I know we're getting close on time, so yeah, I will I will no breeze through these. So no problem. Um, I would say the main um, downside of HNSW, as commonly implemented today, is that it requires a lot of memory um, in order to be a performance system. Uh, you still need to read quite a few vectors during indexing and also at query time, which make you know like the performance, the fast performance in the system, you know, you, you typically want like really low latencies if you're, if you're going to be going with an approximate solution, um, mm -hmm. like a little bit challenging, like from a, from a resource profile. Mm -hmm. And there's a few uh, methods that people have used to kind of get around this. So Vespa is another uh, vector search engine. Um, they, they put out this really nice paper about like, you know, billion scale uh, vector search with HNSW, like what would be a good way of doing mm -hmm. this? And they talk about this idea of building HNSW graphs over centroids of vectors, mm -hmm. and then like having those centroids map back to the original vectors that was used to produce them. Um, and then searching against that posting list of, of vectors that is, so you basically retrieve, uh, you build an index structure on your centroids, and then given the closest centroid, look at the, the posting list of, of the vectors, that are associated with that centroid and then find the closest one. Mm -hmm. So in this way, it's like your graph is actually a pretty small footprint. And then you can, uh, you know, store on disk, um, this posting list of, of vectors, which is much smaller than like yeah. the total number of vectors that might exist in your graph, which is like a, a kind of a nice method. Like you're basically just leveraging, uh, you know, centroids. So if you have some idea of, of the structure of your data at mm -hmm. index time, um, you can exploit it. And actually with our system, I think that, that would work really well. Um, mm. So MongoDB Atlas Vector Search is built on top of Lucene. Mm. Lucene is a segment, uh, an immutable segment-based system. Um, you could basically define a way of, of having centroids uh, be defined such that each Lucene segment is is populated um, like intelligently. So you, mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're counting for the centroids um, when you're writing uh, vectors to a Lucene segment. So each mm -hmm. HNSW graph corresponds to a given centroid. It's kind of an inversion of this idea a little bit, um, but it gives you like this nice thing where you can say like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in these four centroids. So I'll explore mm -hmm. these four HNSW graphs that are associated with them because they're the closest to um, closest to my query vector. Yeah, that's um, not even, uh, that's not, that I, I wasn't even thinking mm -hmm. about like, oh, memory. Oh, what, what happens when you go to scale with this? Oh, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and finding a efficient ways of, of both like storing these indexes in memory and finding ways of searching them, mm -hmm. like getting to the right uh, segment in Lucene, which are, contains its own HNSW graph, mm -hmm. um, could be really useful. Even within that, you could have, you, yeah, there's like all these different optimizations you can make. I have an, another set of slides that's talk about product quantization, but I'm, I think I'm actually going to skip over these because it's, okay. it's, it's a, basically another method of, um, a vector compression, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, which a lot of people have 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 really taken to in recent years. Okay. But yeah, I those are basically the the ends of my slides. Um, I had nice. a couple call outs here, a call to actions. If if you're interested and want to want to try out uh, Atlas Vector Search, uh, we have a brand new documentation for the new Dollar Vector Search stage that was that was recently announced. I also have this little dinky. Uh, repo, which has a bunch of examples of doing RAG uh, with our Atlas Vector Search product, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, there's this blog post on sort of like more advanced um, entity extraction from, from PDFs using unstructured IO, and then using that along with Atlas Vector Search um, for also retrieval under the generation. Nice, nice. And so uh, obviously the links on the screen are not clickable. So the, the links oh, yeah. to these, well, the links <laughs> to these are in the video description. So if you're on YouTube in the video description, their links are, the links are right there. Um, on LinkedIn, they are in the event as well. Uh, and we might, and we posted them in the chat as well. So definitely check out uh, those uh, document, the documentation, the code snippets, etc. Let me, uh, there you go. Unhide your screen. And um, uh, 
any, any of the last words? I really appreciate uh, you joining us, Henry. Um, this has been a very good topic. I mean, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot as well. Um, any last words? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I guess I, if this stuff's of interest to you, like, um, you know, I, I would love for folks to, to try it out and like give feedback on, on the product and what they yeah. think about different indexing methods. There's There's definitely like a lot of research out there about like newer types of of indexing structures, but uh, HSW seems to be quite popular and, and broadly useful today. Um, so awesome. yeah, I'm, I'm happy I got to talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, I got we got a, a bunch of uh, feedback in the comments. Uh, great session, excellent. Uh, appreciate it. So um, I think this is great. Again, this is recorded. If you weren't able, if you didn't catch the beginning, or if you weren't able to stay uh, video on demand, you'll be able to watch it. Just go over to our YouTube channel. Um, and, and come back tomorrow on YouTube. We're going to be premiering a tutorial to help you build AWS Lambda serverless functions with Java and MongoDB. And then on Thursday, we're going to have a double feature. We're going to be streaming with the folks from Cito AI talking about AI in maritime. And then right after that, we're going to have another stream announcing the MongoDB provider for Entity Framework Core. So we've got stuff for Java developers, C Sharp developers, AI stuff, just tons of content coming out. So um, if this was helpful, give this video a like, subscribe for more MongoDB content, and we'll see everyone next time. Thank you again, Henry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for the comments. And yeah, this was great. Awesome. Bye.